My dad had one of those uh, two-sided belts. One side was brown, the other side was whip. <laughs> so <laughs> when we saw the brown belt, we didn't mind, my brother and I, but when he took it off, we knew he was switching sides. And the thing that we used to do, my brother was usually the one that created most of the problems, and he's not here to defend himself, and my sister's too young to remember, so you're just going to have to believe me. And so as soon as these would ha- this trouble would, co- would arise, or if I was the one causing the trouble, when we saw... When we saw the punishment coming towards us, the first thing we did was we tried to convince my dad that it was the other one. It's not me, dad. It was Ralph. And Ralph was like, I didn't do a thing. It was Joe, man. He did it. Well, who did this, Joe? Well, who did it, Ralph? We blamed each other constantly on what we did and what we did wrong and whatever the situation was. All we did was blame the other person for what we did. So guess what? We both got that side of the belt. My dad would say, but you're both getting it then. Now, I know today people don't believe in spanking their kids. And since we're not online, let me just say that's probably what's wrong with America. So. Now, you didn't mean to do that, but do you really feel that it was appropriate to blow the house up? After 37 times, I told you not to play with the blowtorch and the gas can. (laughs) I'm going to do it anyway. Well, you seem a little conflicted, so I don't want to add to it. (laughs) I'm still here. I'm not upset because my dad spanked me. The Bible comes to instruct, direct, protect, protect, And what did I say? I say that all the time. Instruct, direct, correct, and protect. That's what the Bible comes to do. And if we can allow God to do that, we're going to be a blessed people. But you see, trouble begins when you blame others and you don't take responsibility for your own actions. This is what we can't do here. So we didn't get reprimanded as kids because we could convince my dad that the other one did it. We both got it because neither one of us could admit to it. And what I found out, which was so amazing, that if I just told my dad the truth, he didn't spank me. If I just told him the truth, he would work with me. But because I was so bullheaded, like some of us, that, that's what we did. So now watch this. I'm going I'm to build this up a little bit. In John 21, verse 21, it says, So Peter saw him, John. Peter saw John, and he asked Jesus. Now, the apostles are sitting there like this, and Peter sees John, and Peter says to Jesus, he says to him, he says, So what's going to happen with him? Jesus replied, If I decide to let him live until I return, what concern is that of yours? You must still keep on following me. Well, verse 23 says, the rumor started to circulate among the believers that this disciple wasn't going to die. But Jesus never said that, only he said, if I let him live until I return, what concern is that to you? So anytime you get away from your own business and mingle in somebody else's, you start a rumor. And when you start a rumor, you are not going to get blessed because you're too busy trying to figure out and crack the code on something that's none of your business. And that's what we do. We mingle in people's lives. Churches mingle in people's lives. I don't mean churches mingle in your lives. Churches mingle in other churches' lives. Mind your own business and stay the course in which God has led you. Don't worry about what your brother is doing wrong. Just make sure what you're doing is right. So if you build a relationship, I I have to build this, so you please, if you'll allow me. So we try to figure out what Jesus meant for someone else when we should be seeking him to find out what he needs from us. See, the Bible says, seek first and you'll receive. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness, and then you'll receive. You can't seek if you're busy prying or meddling or blaming. You can't have a long, good life because getting in other people's business, bitterness because of what they're doing, upset because of what they're doing, is going to only eliminate your long, 
good life. First of all, it's going to take away the good, and it's going to make it miserable because no man is good, the Bible says. Only God is good. So if you mingle in other people's business, that means you're not taking on your own relationship with Jesus, and you're so busy mingling and mingling and mingling that you're removing the good out of your life. And when you remove the good out of your life, the length of your life is removed. I mean, it's all right here. But this is what started me on this message in in Psalms 34, 12 and 13. It says, do you want to live a long, good life? I didn't write this. That title isn't even mine. I took it from this song. Do you hold on and just bear down on your thoughts for a moment. Hold on to those two words right there. Do you, not anyone else, not the people around you, not your family, not your children, do you want to let, what, I'm the parent, Joe. I got responsibility. I got to take care of my kids. You can't put on your kid's mask if you don't have your own oxygen. If you've never flown, you'll figure that out when you do. Do you want a long, good life, enjoying the beauty that fills each day, then never speak a lie or allow wicked words to come from your mouth? <laughs> How many people know that if you keep your attention on what everybody else is doing, wicked words are going to come from your mouth? They usually start with you, lousy, no good. And then once you speak them, you start believing that. And once you believe that, you start moving on that. And once you start moving on that, you start removing your long, good life. Somebody say amen. Okay. So, I want to say this? Yes. I, I pretty much said it, but I, this was for the screens, but we don't have them up. But frustration comes when we stop focusing on what our mouth is doing and begin to find fault in the mouths of those around us. We stop focusing on what our mouth is doing, and we begin to focus on what everyone else's mouth is doing. Somebody say amen. Okay, let me know you're out there. So in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, I love what, what Paul said. He said, test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, and living your lives as a committed believer. Why don't you see, hear that again? Test and evaluate your neighbor, your family, your friend. No, 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 no. Test and evaluate yourself. Some translations say examine yourself. Examine yourself and make sure you are living faith and living your lives as a committed believer. Examine yourself, as it says, he goes on to say, because he brought it, drew it out, Examine yourself, Paul said, not me. Don't examine me. Examine you. Amen? When you find fault, that's because you chose to examine someone else. If you were examining you, then you would have found fault in yourself and been more generous to that other person and not written them off for fault's sake, but you would have helped them and brought them both to the place where we need to be. So this is all how the Word of God says for us. So it says, or do you not recognize this about yourself? Hmm. Of course you're not going to recognize it about yourself if you're not spending time examining yourself. So I don't want to go any further than that, but I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and we're going to talk about Paul. Now, I'm going to explain to you, and I'm going to teach you today how you have built a relationship with God. If you're a new believer or if you're an ancient believer and you say, well, I pray, but I don't pray very much because I really don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray, God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. No, that's not. He just said that that's an example of prayer, and if you take the meaning of that, it's going to take a lot longer than our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Okay? So you have to say, what and how do I pray? Why do I have to spend time with God? Why do I have to get quiet with God? Why, why do I have to get away from everybody else to be with God? Because if you're not away from everybody else, then you're going to start examining everybody else. You understand where I'm coming from? So we're going to talk about Paul here. And when you, when you get in your prayer closet, there is two things that you need, only two things. You don't need worship. You can sing your own song. Because I can't find a song today. I guess I'm not going to go in my prayer closet. You don't need a song from the internet. Sing one yourself. Make one up like you did when you were a kid, walking around the house just making songs up. Make one up to Jesus. I love you, Lord. You're so wonderful. I love you. I love you. I love you. You know, whatever. And the second thing you need, I'm sorry, the first thing you need, rather, is your Bible. The second thing you need is time. You need to remove time. You need to be where you need to be without time. 
You need to be in your prayer closet with two items. This and the ability to erase time and say, Lord, I will be here as long as you need me. Way to go, Joe. We have a job. It's always going to be an excuse. But if somebody invited you to something you wanted to go to, you'd make time. You see, there is only 24 hours in every day. Everybody in the world has the same amount of time. It's just what you do with yours. So when somebody says, I don't have time, hey, can you meet for lunch? I don't have time. They're not saying they don't like you. They're just saying, I have a commitment that is going to take up that slot of time, and I can't make it for you. But we all have time. It's just what are we doing with it? So let's get in our closet with two items. Forget time. Could take you five minutes in there with God, or could take you five hours. I've done both. I've been in the closet. I've been in there for, not literally my closet, guys. I don't have enough room for my clothes. But basically my private time with God. And sometimes I've been in there for five minutes. And sometimes I have been in there for five hours. And God has kept my wife away. Thank God, thank God, thank God for, for, for um, I don't even know the name of the store, Home Goods. She'll walk those aisles, man. She's a creative person. She sees things on those shelves, and she's like, yes, I can see what I could do with that. She's a very creative person. So God will increase her creativity so I can have the whole house for my time with him. Amen. And she, she has a, I have a way of getting out of the house when she needs time. She says, get out. <laughs> so I do. But let me show you what we do and what we do as a body of believers around the world, what you need to do in your prayer closet. You spend time with Jesus. You just sit there and be quiet and worship him. But my mind wanders. If, you're, if it's wandering, let it wander. But you're spending time with him. If you have worship and you like it, put it on. But if not, spend time with him. It may be three minutes. It may be five minutes. I get up in the morning before I say one word to any human being. 16 minutes of instrumental worship between me and God. I just sit there and let him start my day on the right foot. So, then you go to the scriptures. Without the scriptures, you cannot Spend time with God. You cannot have an effective prayer closet if you do not go to the scriptures. You say, well, I don't understand them. Just start reading them. They'll make sense to you. You say, I don't know what, what you mean by that. Okay, if you are walking down the street in the middle of flu season and somebody sneezes, a virus, a viral bacteria attaches itself to you and if, if, you're not, if you're not of the healthy of healthies, that viral bacteria gets in you and that infection comes upon you. Then you go home and you sneeze and cough and spread it to your family. And before you know it, the entire household is sick. Why? Because something attached itself to us. In your prayer closet, you take the scriptures and attach themselves to you. If you don't attach them to you, then you cannot have a walk properly with God. You see? You can only have so many gatherings and then you have to do it on your own. So you say, okay, what are the scriptures? If you read the epistles, which are the apostles, the, the, the books Paul wrote, Peter wrote, you know, John wrote, or you read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you read those, those came from the throne of heaven. You have to understand it. If you say, well, say, Paul's not Jesus. Are you kidding me? Let me explain to you what I explained on Tuesday night. When Moses saw God, the glory of God came upon Moses... And he was so powerful that he put a veil over his face because the people could not look into his face because the glory was so much upon him. But the glory faded because they were only seeing a partial glory of God. When the apostles walked on earth with Jesus, they walked with the glory of God with Jesus. But they had not seen the fullness of his glory because it had not yet happened yet. When Jesus died and rose and then came back and appeared to over 500 people, you understand in a court of law, you only need 13 people to make something a fact, but throughout time, 500 people saw him crucify and walk around a city. So they saw this, but Jesus said, I have not yet come into my glorified body, so you're not still not seeing the fullness of me. But then you take Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who has been trained in religious law, his whole life, and there was no one smarter than him in the entire region. And so then you take Paul, who is moving through life, reacting, killing Christians, killing anybody, because they are not coming under the understanding of his way of understanding the law. 
Doesn't mean what he was doing was right, but it doesn't mean what he was doing was wrong either because he was just following what Isaiah said. He, I'm following what the Old Testament said. You shall have no other gods before you. Why are you making this a God? But what Paul found, forgot to do because he was more, he was strongholded on one, mo- on one thought is he, he forgot what Isaiah talked about. If you read in the book of Isaiah, you see that Isaiah prophesied, not only prophesied Jesus' return or come, but he prophesied exactly how it was going to happen. He was going to die on a cross. He was going to be mangled so people can't believe him. He was going to rise. And when he rises, his glory was going to rise upon the people. See, he forgot that part right there because he was just in the traditional body bondage of law, 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 law. You understand what I'm saying? So as he continued to understand that, you see Paul was doing a disservice, but God looked at Paul and said, you I can use, I put you on this earth because of your stubborn bullheadedness. I know you will not back down. So on the road to Damascus, Paul, the only human being on the face of this earth that has been written in this Bible, was the one who saw Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all the glory of heaven in one moment. It took all of heaven to transform that mind mind right there. I don't know if everybody understands what I'm saying. No one on earth had seen the fullness of God's glory except Paul the apostle. Are you hearing me? Paul, on the road to Damascus, he said a light shone. He saw Jesus. He didn't just see Jesus. He saw Jesus in the glorified body. Because none of the other people on earth could see it because he had not yet died for our sins and rose to seat at the right hand of the Father. So he was not in his fullness until after the resurrection and the ascension into heaven. Now he stands at the right hand, which is the hand of judgment, not really God's right hand, because they are one, you understand. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Done. Amen? So now, the fullness of this glory, which is the creator of all things from absolutely nothing, the redeemer, the forgiveness of all sins for eternal glory, and three, the Holy Spirit, the power, the breath, and the action of everything that God is, stood before Paul and said, why do you persecute me? Amen? And Paul said, oh, no. In one minute, the most prominent Jewish man in the region, in one flash of God's glory, did this man completely understand everything the apostles understood in three years. Now, he didn't understand details, but he understood the fullness of his glory. The apostles didn't even understand that until Pentecost. Paul didn't even have to go through Pentecost. He didn't have to walk with Jesus. He didn't have to, he didn't have to carry baskets and feed 15,000 people. He didn't have to do nothing. He just had to show up on Damascus one day, and God said, now, boom, done. So when you read the writings of Paul, you are reading the fullness of the glory of God. That's why Paul was able to go to Corinth and Colossae and Galatia and all the different regions of Greece and Turkey and all these different places in Rome. And he was able to take a church that was out of line and twist it back into line again because his words were from the glory of the fullness on his road to Damascus. Amen? So when you read this today, you are reading the fullness of God's glory coming from Paul who got God's word on the road to Damascus and he's saying, the same way I transformed all the corruption from Corinth to Greece to Turkey to Rome to to, um, uh, the province of Asia, all the way I have transformed all these people is the same way I will transform you. But you have to get in your prayer closet and you have to take the word of God and you have to attach it to yourself instead of attaching the things of the world to yourself. Amen. So, here's one example from 2 Peter 1. Now, you say, wait, Joe, this is is Peter. (laughs) Same thing. These These are not people. These are not people that just go, I want to write something good. These are people that literally 
got transformed by the glory of God. Paul was one. The rest of the apostles were two. But Jesus said, Peter, on the thought process of you understanding me as the Christ, I will build the structure of my church on you. Not you, Peter the man, but what you just said because it was a revelatory comment from God himself, which God said, he is the Christ. Peter was the first one, okay, get a hold of this now. Peter was the first one to recognize, not recognize Jesus as the Christ. God gave him a download and said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah that every, every prophet, major and minor prophet from the book of Genesis all the way to the, the book of, of uh, Malachi, you were, the, you were the one that everyone was talking about. That is the Christ. He just spoke it with his mouth, but he never believed it in his heart. That's why he denied Jesus three times. After he received Jesus at Pentecost, and the glory of God came, and the tongues of fire came upon each one of them. Then there was no more denial. Peter was crucified upside down on the cross because he didn't want to die the same way Jesus did, and he didn't care. Same way with the rest of the apostles. So when you're reading this, I'm going to give you some things that you attach yourself. I'm going I'm to take you in very simply, very shortly, into my prayer closet, and I'm going to show you that after you spend moment with God, then you begin to attach scriptures unto yourself, and you pray through these scriptures unto yourself, you see. So in 1 Peter 1, he says, by divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Done. You don't need anything else. What do you need? Self-help books? You got a self-help book. It's right here. Take it into your closet with you. All right? Self-help, self-help professors, take that into your closet with you. It's all in here, but I don't understand it. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. He will help you. But if you don't spend time with him, he won't help you. You can't. He's not going to want to help you. It's he can't because you're off and running again. You know? So it's like he says this. He says, we have received all of this by coming to know him. What Peter's saying is, we have, come, we, have, we have gathered all this, we have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. He called us, watch this, he called us to himself as, as followers, but on the 50 days after the resurrection at Pentecost, he called us unto himself by his glory, not just by follow me with his words, but then he attached his glory to it. So when Paul Peter is writing, that's why Peter can say, everything has been given to us that we need to live a godly life, and I'm going to share it with you. But if you don't get in your prayer closet and you don't spend time with God every single day, then you will not be attaching the proper things to you to live that, lo- that good, long life. So he goes on to say this, is, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises, and these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. I'm telling you how to get out of this thing. Thank you, Joe. Now... Let me pause for a second, just a quick second, okay? And let me share this with you. You come to church, you go to a, a, a conference, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, and you feel the presence and the power of God, and you walk out of there, and if you do not spend time in your prayer closet, you become absolutely useless. And everything that you just did was like going to a carnival and eating popcorn and cotton candy and ice cream and candy. It'll only make you sick. What? What? You're telling me that the more I go to church and the more I go to these wonderful conferences, it's going to make me sick? Yeah, it's going to kill you. Why? Because all you're doing is absorbing everything, but you're not attaching it to you. What? What are you talking about? Jesus, spend time with him. Spend time with him. Yeah, this doesn't sell in mainstream church, does it? Because you have to allot every moment. I taught 500 plus kids and got ridiculed by every single parent. I taught them a song when they were little, when I taught children. And I said, Pastor Joe, my mom makes us get up and go to school. My mom does this, my mom does that. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. And I taught them a song. Well, what do you have to do every day? You have to use the bathroom. You have to use the bathroom in the morning, sometime during the day. Maybe some people use it three, four, five, six times. I don't know. 
But I taught these kids a song. Make time to pray like you make time to pee. And when the parents got hurt, hurt, got word of that, they began to say, what is he teaching? Dear God, he said pee in church. <laughs> but guess what kids started to do? They started to pray when they were going to the bathroom. They, started, they got up in the middle of the night. I taught them to pray. Start somewhere. Build your prayer closet. Prayer is a huge in importance, but people don't pray because they don't know how. I'm teaching you right now. Attach it to yourself. Now, let's go back to verse 5. In the views of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises and supplement, or the Bible says, or add to. So you have to continuously add. You cannot walk in your prayer closet and have all the answers in one day. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have to add to. One step of a time, the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept. Don't miss anything. Gain a little bit at a time. It took me two, three, four months to get through the book of John because it was only five verses a day. That's all you read was five verses a day? I read five verses a day, but then I broke down those five verses. I got an understanding of those five verses, the culture of those five verses, so I can bring it to the surface, simple for you, but I was attaching those verses to me. Amen? You will not be shaken in this world today if you attach the word of God to you. But you will be shaken if the world comes along. That's why you take every pharmaceutical drug that comes on your TV set. You sitting there watching somebody talking about CPOD or whatever that thing is where you can't breathe. Forgive me, I know it's a very serious disease. But as they're talking about how serious this is, you got this grandfather pushing his granddaughter on a swing, making you feel it's no big deal, and then they rush through those things at the very end, attaching to your mind, but it could cause this, 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 and this. So there's nothing wrong with certain drugs. I mean, I know there's the drugs keep people alive, but you have to understand, you have to attach this because this will keep you alive. There's no side effects to it. Okay, so the Bible says, Peter says, he wants you to respond to this, what he's about to say here. So I'm questioning, I mean, I'm, I'm challenging all of you, a prayer closet, a prayer time with Jesus. I'm going to go over it again. You bring your Bible into your prayer closet, you read through the Gospels, the Epistles, you start reading, just start reading, and don't worry about reading. How many did you read today? I got to read the whole Bible in a year. Don't put that pressure on yourself. You don't have to read the whole Bible in a year. You don't have to read the whole Bible in two years. There was a person I knew who read the Bible cover to cover every single month and didn't know no more after it than they did before because you didn't spend time understanding it and saying, Jesus, I'm attaching this to me. The world is coming against me, but the word of God says, fear not, for I am with you. That's going on me. Where's my safety pin? I'm putting that one on me right here. And you go in there daily so you don't forget to reattach and reattach more. But you have to add two. So you can't, re you can't attach many things to you in one day. You attach one thing at a time. God will show you. It says right here, it says, add to your faith. The faith means strong, confidence, character of the one who can be relied on, Jesus. If you don't have faith, then you can't even begin the attachment process. You have to first yearn for faith. And that comes with what Dominique was saying when we were worshiping. Do you know Jesus with all your heart or, or are you stubborn and say, I don't need to know him because that's what everybody says and that person knows him and they're sick and that person knows him and they're miserable. That's because they just know him with their mouth. So did Peter. But he was denying and running and hiding and lying. Do you understand that? Peter spoke about Jesus with his lips, not his heart. And he ran and they said, are you the one that was with the Messiah? Wasn't me. So now he's a liar. Now he's breaking the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not lie. You see what I'm saying? Because he had, no, he had no substance. There wasn't anything attached. But now he's talking right now and he's saying, I figured it out. Attach him to you. He says, add to your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. That means strive for, for moral purity, for modesty, for purity. Strive for the excellence of God, not the corruption. How do I first attack that? Get your mind off of everybody else's business and put it back on God and you. When you're not looking at the world, then you don't strive on the purity or, or the corruption of the world. You're focused in your closet on the purity of God. Is this making sense? 
So from your faith, the first thing he asks you to do after he tells you to believe is to get your head on straight and take your eyes off the world and start looking at Jesus. Then he says, and with generous provision of moral excellence, he said, then, then add to that knowledge. What is knowledge? Moral wisdom and right living. Start living a godly life. Start working a godly life. How do I do that? It's right here. It's right here. Don't use foul or abusive language. Don't, don't, don't get drunk beyond drinking and create debauchery. Don't commit adultery. Don't da 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 all the way down the line. Oh, that's Old Testament. I can do whatever I want. God will forgive me. You can do whatever you want, but don't blame God because you don't have a long, good life. Amen? So then, from the knowledge, he said, <laughs> this is a, this one's killer right here. You put your eyes on other people, you can't, hit, you can't get this one. He said, then, with knowledge, add self-control. That means taking control of this thing right here. How do you take control of this? Because if it's pla- out of the heart, the mouth speaks. But some, some people just speak out of the surface of their brain because they're so hurting. They're so passionate with their own pain. They won't spend no time with Jesus. They will not attach one scripture to them and live by it. So they take it out on everybody else and they find problems about everybody. And they can't control this right here. So self-control mastered your desires and your passion. You can't master, you cannot stop an addiction of pornography or drinking or whatever your addictions are, immoral addictions. You cannot stop these immoral addictions until you are in your prayer closet with your tool saying, Jesus, give me a scripture. See, people are like, I'm waiting. No, just go to the gospel. Start reading. And when you read one and you go, you know how many people meet me at the door after service? That message was just for me. It wasn't just for you. There's all the other people here and the people online watching. It wasn't just for you. What they're trying to say is it hit home to me. Why did it hit home to you? You all know in this church, I'm a scripture reader. I don't make stuff up. I read the scriptures. So the same scriptures I give to you that you go, that was for me. Go in your prayer closet and say, that's for me. That one's being attached to me today, and I'm not moving from it. Amen? So from the, more, the self-control, it says, then you go from self-control to patience and endurance. <laughs> you can't have patience and endurance and stand steadfast and don't get off course from God's train and jump onto the world train. You can't do that if your mind is on absolutely everybody, everywhere. If you don't start your day or end your day in time with Jesus and people, don't worry about how you look. You don't have to get all holy and start... <laughs> He got in into that. He side swipes me. I don't care. I, I told you the other day, I was coming out of the, 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 one, of the one of the rooms of our house and, uh, to watch TV with my wife, and I'm taking a step, and I just pause. There he was. He just told me something that was happening in my prayer closet three days ago. But he decided to answer me right now. So guess what? Terry's sitting on the couch. We're waiting to restart some movie that we were watching. And I couldn't start it. I, my thumb wouldn't even work. I couldn't put it on there. I'm like, I couldn't get my thumb to hit play. I said, we got to talk about what he just said. We got to talk. Well, Joe, where did, that's amazing. Where did you get that from? Your prayer closet. You see, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a figure of speech, prayer closet. It does, it's people are going to go home and like, get the clothes out of here. I'm going to pray in here. No, I'm not, it's not a closet, guys. It's a time by yourself with Jesus. The Bible declares Jesus went away by himself. If Jesus would go away by himself, why wouldn't you go away by yourself? If he made the, he even got mad at the apostles. Stay up. Quit sleeping. We're in the hour. We're, everything that the Bible had talked about since the beginning of time, we're in that hour, and you're taking a nap because you're not trained. Listen to me. You're not trained to stay awake and press in. You're just trained to receive from a speaker and go, that was good. I'm going home. And then when the rubber meets the road, you don't have the material for it because you just heard it from my lips, but it wasn't attached by your hands. Well, can I go home? And, yeah, you can go home. If you're taking notes today, go home and take the scripture notes that I gave you, not the verbal notes. Go take the scripture notes and say, that is me. Lord, I need more faith. And pray on that every day. Pray on that every single day. And then from faith, go to, go to the provision of moral excellence and self-control, and then patience, and then endurance. And then from patience and endurance, then go to godliness, which is to continue the reverence of God and respect God and fear him. The word fear means to respect and reverence. 
and move yourself on to that level. And then from godliness, brotherly affection, which is to share this all with others. And then from brotherly affection is to love everyone. So God is trying to say here, if you move one step at a time, you will get yourself to find a human being to share the love of God with. And the time will come that if you in your prayer closet and you keep adding on and adding on words of God, attaching them to yourself, then you're going to look like if it was a sticky pad, you wouldn't be able to see your entire body because you'd be full of attachments that you placed upon yourself. And then the Bible declares, when you do that, when you press into God, when you attach that which is in the word of God from the one who saw the glory of heaven, then you yourselves will be able to go from everything that he talked about to love for everyone. You will look at every human being with love. When you do that, the goodness of your life begins and the length of your life increases. Now, goodness is not what's in your pockets. Goodness is not money. Goodness is not a good 401k so you can retire. Goodness is not getting your degree. Those are moments of happiness. Those are moments of comfort. But if the Bible declares that no man is good good but God, then no man understands good but God. I'm going to say that again. You ought to get your pencils out and write that down. And if you don't have any paper, use the person's shirt in front of you. Hmm. If God is the only one that is good, then God is the only one that understands good. So until God applies good to you, you have not experienced it yet. Because it says in the book of Psalms, it says, do you want to live a long good life? Those of you that are happy for moments of your life are not living a long good life. You are living Happy moments, not a good life. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord, Jesus, verse 8 says. (laughs) You cannot be productive until you go line upon line and precept upon precept. You cannot be productive because Pastor Joe told you this. You cannot be productive because an amazing speaker spoke these words to you. Oh, that was marvelously brilliant. I don't care how brilliant it is. I don't care if you took notes. I don't care if you stuck them on your refrigerator. I don't care if you told your wife and husband about them. I don't care if the person is the most prominent speaker on the planet. It is useless, and you have not experienced good. You've only experienced a moment of happiness. But when you put your time in God, and you bring your weapon into your prayer time, and you worship him, when I was a Catholic boy, The first thing that happened to me was I was flying to India. Do you know how far it is to India? Calcutta, India, in coach on the red eye. And I'm sitting there, and I had my Bible. I had never even read it all yet. This was 1994. I'm flying to India with my pastor. And I sit this Bible... And I didn't have nothing to do. So the whole plane was my prayer closet. And do you know, I didn't understand this. Look, people, I was a Catholic. Some of you out there are Baptists. Some of you are Methodists. Some of you are Jewish. Some of you are Jehovah's Witness. Some of you are whatever you are. It doesn't make a difference wherever you are. When you line up with the Word of God, you become a Christian. And so I took the Bible in my prayer time, and I just sat there, because there was no, this was 1994, there was no, you know, music you could listen to, you had to have a, a cassette or a Walkman, can you imagine me, well, I'm just going to start my worship now, you know, 
No, no, you didn't have nothing. So I just sat there in the beautiful hum of the plane. I just closed my eyes. I remember, I remember rocking like this. I'm not Lou Engle, but I do like to move back and forth like the Jews. They daven at the wall. You know, I, there's, there's something about doing this. I don't know what it is, but I just like to do this. And I was sitting there, and I hit my head on the front of the chair in front of me because it was only four inches away because, you know, they cram you in this lobster tank. So <clears throat> I'm flying, and I, I lean back, and I take the book, and I say, I don't know this book. Where do you want me to start? And I went like this. As God is my witness, because it was him that did it. In front of me, with my eyes closed, I saw in big black letters, Roman 12, 2. And I opened the Bible up, and I had a notepad, and I'm like, oh my gosh. You're transforming the renewing of your mind so you know it's pleasing and perfect will. You memorize that? Well, heck yeah, it was the first one he gave me. And then I'm like, oh. so I wrote it down. I didn't even know what it meant. And then I closed the Bible, and I said, that was awesome, God. And I, and I was just resting like this. Another scripture. Whoa, I wrote it down. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And then I went, because I had nothing to do. I had nothing to do. And I went, and I wrote all the scriptures out. I wrote them hard, shorthand, I mean, you know, old school with a pen on a piece of paper. And we still have those scriptures today. Because those scriptures told the story of what was about to happen to Terry and I's life. And every one of those scriptures have been fulfilled. But the first one he gave me is you need to have your mind transformed from the world and renewed to Jesus. Not the Jesus you think you know, but the Jesus I'm about to show you. And that you cannot get by listening to a magnificent speaker or speakers. Man, woman, doesn't make a difference. You cannot get that knowledge by standing up at the altar and worshiping till you weep and shake. You cannot get that from that. You can only get that when you're in your prayer closet on your knees and it becomes revelatory to you and you say, that is mine, and you attach it to yourself. Amen? Would you stand with me? Can I get some instruments up here? So those of you that spend time in your prayer closet, that you are dedicated, your prayer time, now you have a new mission. Don't go in your prayer closet without this book. Well, what if I don't have my Bible? You have every version on the planet on your phone. Pull that out and wait before the Lord. Wait, but that's Joe what gets me. I start waiting, then I figure out I forgot to pay a bill, then I gotta, gotta do it right now, I'm gonna forget again. Write it on the wall of your house. Pay the electric bill after Jesus' time. But sit there and sit there and sit there. You can play a little pad if you like. And the journey begins with a revelatory commitment. Not like Peter made. The Bible says in Romans, believe in your heart. You'll profess it with your mouth. You have to profess it. But Joe, I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I fully believe yet. I don't, you don't have to. Do you understand? You have to know that he, you have to attach to your mind the fact that he died on the cross. There were more witnesses of the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus than anything in the world at that time. But I don't know if there was... It's real, people. Stop using excuses and get to the long, good life. Those of you that are happy without Jesus, I don't need him. I'm happy. Yes, but you're not living good. Why are you just settling for happy? Happy could change at any moment. Good never changes. Come on, people. Are you getting the whole of this? It's just me and you up here. It means you're going to play and I'm going to sing. Worthy is the Lord. 
Come on, follow me. Make me sound good. <laughs> I'm going to spend time in my prayer closet with you. Me and you, Jesus, me and you, Jesus, nobody but me and you. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to worship only you, Lord. And you're going to talk to me. And I will attach all your words to me. And devil, if you try to attack me, you're going to have to get through... Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Romans, and e e Ephesians, and Colossians, and, and Deuteronomy, and Isaiah. Come on, you think you can get through all that? No, because they're attached to me, Lord. I said, you're attached to me, Lord. I said, you're attached to me, Lord. One by one. One by one. One scripture at a time. One promise at a time. The world can't get you down. You won't bother looking at everybody else because that's their problem. And you will have brotherly love with Jesus Christ himself and you will be able to love the whole world and you will have no worries about who's in the government office and what this guy's doing or what this lady's doing or what this officer's doing. You're going to say, Jesus, nothing is impossible with you because I understand good and where good is, bad cannot dwell. Yeah.